Amen. Open your Bible to Philippians this morning. And uh, amen. What a beautiful Sunday. Amen. I, I, uh, I found, uh, I wanted to preach to you a sermon I just called the Sabbath blessing, you know, but I um, only have time to preach four sermons, so I'm just kind of finding the mind of God, I hope, and I want to minister to you. But, uh, you know, you need to know how to refresh yourself on the Sabbath. Amen. In other words, chill and worship God. Just put that time aside and, you know, and understand it's a blessing to you. Philippians chapter 4 is where I'll begin. And then I'm going to also, you know, touch on a lot of scripture in Philippians because I'm going to preach to you this morning about uh, mind control. <laughs> Spooky, huh? No, controlling your own mind. Amen. Getting dominion upstairs. Amen. Wouldn't that be wonderful if we could just rein our thoughts in all the time and have just have things under control. You know, this is a technical, technical, technological age, and, uh, you know, and uh, thank God for Elon Musk. Amen. <laughs> he got his mind right on a few things. Amen. But this guy's brilliant. But, uh, you know, him and AI, every, all the people inventing and doing these things, AI is an incredible thing. It's never going to be able to replace the human mind. Can't. It's incapable of emotion. It's incapable of humor. They try to get it to make jokes. I read some stuff on it, and it's the, it's the most worst. They're worse jokes than your uncle makes, amen. They're just terrible. And, uh, you know, it's just hopeless in th these aspects. And that's because it has no emotional connection, no ability. Your mind and your heart are all built and put together by grand design, the design of Almighty God. And they connect, and, it, you know, we do process life... Uh, much of life through how we feel. Amen. And, you know, you got to learn that you got to control your feelings. Best way to learn that is how to control your mind. Two verses as we begin, uh, because I want you to see how the apostle addresses the people in the Philippi church. In chapter 4, verse 1, he says, So therefore, my brethren, dearly beloved, long for my joy and my crown so Stand fast in the Lord, my dearly beloved. You can't help but read that and know this guy's connected to the heart with these folks. You know, they're his. But he says immediately after he expresses how much he appreciates, loves, and longs for, how happy he is to know them, he immediately says, but I'm asking you girls, Eudicus, Eudicus and Syntyche, get along. I'm in verse 2, that's a paraphrase. He says, I beseech you and Syntyche that you be of the same mind in the Lord. Why I wanted to read that as I begin, because what that promotes to us is that he's got two people in the assembly who are having some kind of conflict. And what he's saying there is somebody has to change their mind. It's hard to change your mind sometimes, especially when you think your mind is right. You have the mind of wisdom. I was going to say the mind of God, but sometimes we know it's not the mind of God. We just know what we feel. <laughs> right? There's our problem. We know what we think. We know what we want. And yet it's not the mind of God at all. And it's not right. And I want to tell you, that causes such conflict in people. I've, I've been around a while now. Amen. <laughs> and oh, sometimes, you know, you see folks who... You, you know, and they'll tell you later, I, I wanted to get that right. I wanted to you know, work this out, but I couldn't get past my feelings. So, yes, you can. Change your mind, first of all. Now, that's very hard. And so over the years, you know, I've counseled with people and worked with folks, and sometimes you come back to this, you know, and you, you think, you know, I've had people come to me and, Tell me how difficult it is because of the way they think, because of what they feel and how they've learned to process life. They can't seem to change these things. It seems impossible, and I'll counsel with them. I will uh, prescribe scripture, amen, as a remedy, not just counseling time, not just man's wisdom, but sometimes you, you give them a good scripture. You Philippians chapter 4, learn how to think on right things, etc., and say this is something... Uh, you know, and I've, I've talked to people. I said, well, listen, I'm going to talk to you about Philippians 4. I read that. No, I'm not talking about the fact that you read it. I'm talking about why don't you practice it? <laughs> well, I already read it. This, I, this is weird. I was witnessing to this poor 
hopeless young man, not long ago, he's probably 30 some years old, but I mean, just a disaster of a life. And it was well known to him and me, and he, he didn't hide it. But when I said, listen, son, you know, you know, we prayed. I said, look, if you'll just start reading the Bible. I already read that. <laughs> I was sitting in jail sometimes four years ago or something. I read the Bible. I'm done. Finished, finished. Yeah, it's a good book. I read it. I read it every day, and I don't get it. Amen. I mean, i got a lot to learn. But I say, listen, if you'll get your mind wrapped around this and you'll learn how to process life this way and think this way, the way the scriptures instruct us, and I'll give someone, here's your prescription, like a doctor, you know, and uh, so you got to stop thinking like that. And this is what a good doctor will do. You ever been to the doctor? And you, because you need help, he, tr you trust that doctor for a medical solution, and they give you a prescription, and you don't go thanks and throw it away. Hopefully, you know, it's something you need and you take that and you get better. But, you know, here's folks, you know, I just need, I got to get through. Here's your prescription study, Philippians 4. Begin to believe this. Trust God. Practice this. And then, you know, I find I'm talking to them six months later, a year later, a week later, five years later. So how's, how's that working? What working? Your prescription. What prescription? Philippians 4. Oh, yeah, I read it. You told me to read it. Well, no, did you start practicing it? Did you take it those every day, you know? <laughs> How many verses did you digest day after day? What am I talking about? I'm talking about this. If the next verse where we stopped was in verse 2, but verse 3 of Philippians 4 says, So I entreat thee also, my true yoke fellow, help those women which labored with me in the gospel, with Clement also, with my other fellow laborers. Their names are written in the book of life. Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. He says it twice. Let your moderation be known to all men. The Lord is at hand. And verse 6 says, be careful for nothing. But in everything by prayer, and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be made known unto God. So here the writer is saying, here's what you got to do. You got to stop. You know, be careful for nothing doesn't mean don't give a care about nothing. It says what that literally means is to stop. Wasting your mind and energy in anxiety. Anxiety. Fretting over things you're not, you have no business fretting over. Things you're not going to change. Things you can't deal with anyway. Things that are not your business. So the Bible says be careful for nothing. But in everything, here's your remedy. is learn to give thanks by prayer, supplication. Let your request be made known to God. And the peace of God that passes all understanding will keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. And how many of you know when you're wrapped up with a bit of anxiety, you do not have peace? That's why you lay in bed at night with your eyes wide open. Unfortunately, many people lay in bed with their eyes wide open looking at the device in their hand. Right? Or the tablet or wherever they got open. And, uh, they, they know, and then they don't know why they can't sleep. I do. Anyway, you have to understand that God is able to give you the peace you want and need. And in verse 8, and this is the part that people, uh, we struggle with. And this is why I'm saying, you know, I've prescribed this. This is the actual prescription. If you want, just a couple of verses here. Finally, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are honest, the things that are just, the things that are pure, the things that are lovely, the things that are of a good report or virtuous. It sounds just like TikTok, doesn't it? <laughs> you laugh because you've seen it. I've never seen it, but I've read enough to know. And I've counseled enough people to try to get their heads screwed back on after being addicted to it. But see, here's what the Bible says needs to be our intake. Beautiful things. Right things, holy things, virtuous things, good report, something that's worthy of praise. And if you can think on these things, uh, that's the thing that's going to give you peace. And then he says, and those things which you've also learned and received and heard and seen in me. He said, do these things and the peace of God will be with you. So we got to consider what we think upon. Amen. And some of you ladies, sometimes you, you ask your husband, what's he thinking? He says nothing. He's probably telling the truth. You just don't believe it. Amen. <laughs> Men have this wonderful ability to be able to just nothing, you know. 
empty space for whatever, however long they need. And, uh, and, and the woman's mind is going, you know, and it's uh, just, we're different. But, you know, there's quite possibly even a vacuum there, amen. That's why you got to put in the right things, things that are right. But see, our thoughts are actually our choice. Can you say amen? It's your choice. It's what you choose to think, to believe. And when someone says, I'm trying not to think about it, it generally means that's exactly what they're thinking about. They, they got this stuck in there. You ever have an old song or something get stuck in there? Just, to, you know. And then trying to tune out and just not engage your brain is not going to help. You have to engage it, and you have to do what the writer suggests here, is, or commands, is you have to begin to think on the right things. You can't just have a vacuum in there. And it's amazing how easy it is to think about the worst things. Amen. Yeah, people can hear an ambulance go down the road, and the first thing they try to think of, oh, where's my kids? Or where's my They're right next to you, you know. Oh, you know, we just begin to go right to the worst. We have an experience we don't like with someone. Somebody uh, puts something on us. Someone gives us tough time. I had a friend. God love him, man. He, he did make it to heaven. Amen. He's gone from us now. But, oh, all the time, all the many years I knew him, you'd, you'd be afraid to ask him, how you doing, bro? Because he'd always say, ah, people are giving me troubles, you know, people. I said, Chewie, you haven't been out of your house all week. How do people give you trouble? You know, just this is just who he was. he was. I loved the guy. We helped him. God helped him. Amen. We loved him. But it was always someone else. That's why I'm feeling like this. That's why I'm not doing well today. Someone else. Have you ever heard of the man Victor Frankel? My interesting guy. He lived in the earlier half and into the mid uh, 1900s. He he was a uh, he became a prisoner of a death camp, Nazi death camp. And he, he had a brilliant mind. This guy was smart. But he, he, he experienced some things that give him some great lessons. And, yeah, he became a, a psychologist, sociologist, all this stuff. He just kind of got confused with a lot of the ways of man. But uh, he said this. He said, we lived in those concentration camps. When he was taken, you know, like many of these people being brought in there, you know, uh, they, they would – take him in by trains, you know, and he, he came all the way there with his wife and his child. But when they got there, immediately they separated him, started throwing him in different lines, you know. And, you know, you were told you were going to go shower and enter the camp, and they just gassed you. This is one of those camps. They're going to kill people. His wife and, and daughter were immediately taken and killed. He was put in another line of men that they were going to sort through and then kill. And somehow he slipped out. Not knowing any of this, he just got pushed to the side, got bumped, something happened, got up. He's in another line, and they put him in a work camp, which killed half of the people that went there. It was just, you know, ungodly torture is what it was. So he ends up immediately stripped of all dignity. He was a brilliant man. He was a man of value in his society, but now he's just one of these common prisoners. He's barely making it through. Men are growing weak all around him. Horrible winter conditions, horrible summer conditions. A piece of bread in the morning, sometimes some at night. Water, and that's it. And work as hard as you can and take abuse from the guards. He's in this condition. And people are breaking down. Grown men are just turning, you know, laying down in fetal position on their cots and just weeping and trembling till they die. They're, they, you know, they're, they're just fading all around him. And he said, we who live in concentration camps can remember the men who walk through the huts comforting others, giving away their last piece of bread. They may have been few in number, but they offer sufficient proof that everything can be taken from a man but one thing, the last of human freedoms. Can you guess what the last of human freedoms is? It is the ability to choose one's attitude in any set of circumstances and to choose your own way. So he's saying as hopeless as this was, we all could have gave up and said it's hopeless and wept and we'd die. He said, but some guys would eat part of their bread, put it in the pocket at night. Here's some poor sucker weeping, crying, you know, you know, just trim. They'd come by, encourage him, give him their last piece of bread. 
Well, wouldn't that wouldn't they starve? No, he said these are the guys that stood up erect, like men. They had dignity and they lived through the camp. It wasn't the guys that cried and hid and trembled. He said every day and every hour offered the opportunity to make a decision, a decision which determined whether you would or would not submit to those powers which threatened to rob you of your very self, your inner freedoms, which determined whether or not you'd become the plaything of circumstances, renouncing freedom and dignity to become molded into the form of the typical inmate. And the point is, in the most horrid of human conditions, you have the ability up here to choose. Am I going to be just dead, hopeless, fearful, give up, or am I going to stand up and say, I have the right to be a man, be a woman, to stand up, no matter what's going on around me. Isn't this something how often things in life, relationships, work situations, family situations, conflicts, conflict with the brethren, you know, you know when the, the church grows, there's more people to have conflict with. <laughs> no, it's just, you know, there are things. You get, you get your toes stepped on sometimes. You step on someone's toes sometimes. It's life. You know, you know just life. You, know, you get bumped a little. It's a wonder, wonderful thing about fellowship. The Bible says iron sharpens iron. What, what that means is like a piece, piece of butcher steel. It's like a file. It's very abrasive, hard steel. But you wipe that other blade up and down on it, and they sharpen each other up. Kind of knocks the rough edges off. And that's what happens when we fellowship and we're with each other. You bump elbows. You know, you, you learn how to get along. You grow in this. But what happens is in all of life, there is the ability to uh, suffer conflict. And in some of life, there are people that put it on you. Everywhere I ever worked in my adult life, I, have, I didn't always uh, full-time ministry, but everywhere I worked, there were people within the system there, you know, whether it was you know, out in the field on the construction sites or from the office end of it, running it, going out, whatever area it was, there were always people there that hated the boss. Because he's an idiot. I said, then why are you working for him? Where's I put you? <laughs> you, <know? laughs> you haven't achieved idiot yet. You're still down here. Amen. <laughs> you know? Ah, the boss is a jerk. The boss, you know, makes my life miserable. You can't get ahead here. I heard that everywhere I ever worked. Guys right alongside of me. Okay, I wouldn't want to believe that. I'm, I'm here to make a living. I had to do, to do well. And everywhere I ever worked, God blessed me. I never, you know, got ran off the job. And I always got raised up and blessed, even by those ungodly, horrible idiots that were my bosses. Amen. You know, but some people get in there and go, no, no, no. They're putting this on me. I, I can't function here. It's horrible. Look what they do to me. In Philippians 4. Reading on, verse 11, Paul the Apostle, remember he says, now look at me, he said, and whatever you see and learn in me, do it, and you'll have the victory. You can do it. Some people look at him and go, look at him. He's all beat up. <laughs> he just got beat to a pulp. He got stoned last week, not stoned, you know, high. He got beat with stones and rocks and left for dead. Look at the bruises, the cuts. Look at Luke, the beloved of the physician, travel with this guy for crying out loud for good reasons. Medical attention, and that's a fact. It's a fact. Bible history points to that. And, you know, here, here's Paul. He looked, you know, I don't want to be in his shoes. He goes, yeah, I, I know how to live a life, man. I got the victory. And he says, because I have learned in verse 11, whatever state I'm in, how to be content right there. I know both how to be abased and how to abound. Everywhere and in all things I'm instructed to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and suffer needs. And he says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. You know, Christians will say that, verse 13, all the time, when they got the victory. <laughs> yeah, man, I can do all things. But while you're going through it, you're not singing that. He says, I have learned how to be abased. Abased doesn't mean I just had a hard time. It literally means Somebody does something to you to put you in a complicated place. That's what that word means. 
Somebody has smacked you one. <laughs> they have stripped something from your life. They have tried to hurt you. Someone has deliberately done this to you. He says, even in that case, hey, I'm fine. They, I don't, like Frankel said, I don't get, let it get in my head. I'm not going to take it personal. Amen. No, this happens to me everywhere I go. You don't understand. I do, because it's right there. You take it with you. It doesn't matter who the perpetrator is, what the trouble is, what the thing is going on. It doesn't matter. It, you know, I've known people that can meet the nicest person on earth, and they're scared of them because it's going to happen again. I know. I'm going to be the one that's hurt. And you're setting yourself up for it. You think this way. That's why I wanted to start with verse 2 here. You know, he says, listen, uh, I know there's some conflict right here. Change your mind, okay? Stop. Stop thinking that way. Why would God instruct us to change our minds if we couldn't do it? We could do it. Why does the Bible say, carry, do not carry these, uh, these burdens, these concerns, ha no anxiety, stop? Why does the Bible say, because you need to and you can now, the problem is, is when we refuse this to, to change how we think, how we process and what we do, we make bad choices. Amen. Then we'll make bad choices. We all will begin to blame someone. That's human nature. We can never just say, yeah, I stepped in it again. That was me. Yes, I shouldn't have thought that way. No, I shouldn't have responded that way. It will, we, if we refuse to do, get this right, we'll, we'll, we'll begin to do that because you have to have somebody to pin the blame on. Can't take it. We're in trouble. We don't realize, you know, how, how those bad decisions, how, how we don't make our minds right, how, how, where that takes us. In, in Isaiah, this is a long time ago, Isaiah prophesied this. He said in verse 7, he's speaking of human nature, and in verse 15, uh, chapter 59, in verse 7, he says, their feet run to evil. People were healthier back then, and their feet could take them there. Now they sit on the couch and bring it home. Evil. They fill their minds with it. They fill their hearts with it. They don't have to go anywhere. They do it at school. They do it at lunch break. They do it in the car. They're, they don't have to go far. Their feet... Bring them to evil. They make haste to shed innocent blood. Have you ever heard uh, that somebody is a hater? <laughs> it's all these guys. I, I, I don't know anybody in life. I never, you know, I've lived a long time. Yeah, they're a real hater. They hate you. In other words, they have to get in someone's business all the time. Read some, I'll respond to that. Hate. <laughs> Why make it your business? We're putting stuff in. Hello. Ah, you got nervous just now. You know where I'm going. Amen. They make it their, they make haste. They're quickly to shed innocent blood. You know, the Bible says, you know, murderous thoughts are enough before God. Hateful thoughts is like a murderous. Their thoughts are iniquity. Wasting destruction are in their path. The way of peace they don't know. There's no judgment in their goings. <coughs> They've made them crooked paths. Whoever goes there will not know peace in other words if you don't straighten this out you will have problems i mean i cannot believe the amount of people teenagers who come in i'm having heart palpitations i'm not having i mean you know it's, it's, well you know there's a lot of them. a little lesson this morning you know you, you know they drink a case of energy drinks by nine o'clock in the morning don't know why they're you know <laughs> But I'm telling you, a lot of it's anxiety. I don't know how I can feel like this. I mean, I'm, I'm you know, I don't know, you know, oh, they're making me do it. My, the, the, where I go to school, it's the school. It's this, it's that. Listen, Viktor Frankl was in a death camp. He said, they can't make you do anything. Oh, they make them work. They can make them fall down when they beat them. They can make them starve when they hold back food. But he says, they can't, you can't don't let them in here. Don't do it. These things that we have in here is where our problems are. Listen to what Jesus said in Matthew 15, in verse 18. He said, it's the things that come out of your mouth, and they come from the heart, and that's what defiles a person, not what's going on around you. That's not our problem. It's what we got in here 
and here. Because if it's in here, it'll come out there. And out of the heart come evil ideas, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false testimony, lies, slander. These are the things that defile a person. It's not just eating with unwashed hands. So sure, it's true. There's outside temptations and things, but when stuff's going on in here, that's when we give in to those things. And in our, in our hearts are darkened. And believe me, our hearts are darkened. Amen. And that's why we had to get saved. This was, you know, early. This is, a, this is in man's fallen nature. I mean, you only got to be on page six of the Bible, basically. Genesis 6. And what's God doing? Killing off the human race. He said, it has gotten bad quick. Why? Because every thought and imagination of the heart had become evil. They didn't take it didn't take long. And now we have so much access to evil. So easy to get. Jesus said in Luke 645, the good person out of the good treasure of their heart produces good. The evil person out of his evil treasure produces evil. So good treasure. Listen, that's the work of grace. We talked about it last night. There's things that can come out of us. That's good. Now we're saved. It wasn't because we, you know, I had a friend of mine. Uh, God love him. Amen. Uh, he had, you know, some, a wicked family member, very wicked. <laughs> He'd tell me something. I was pastoring him in one of the churches I pioneered. And, uh, uh, and he would start to tell me about it. I said, that's enough. I don't need to know about all these details. Listen, let's pray for this guy. You make a stand and witness. And he'd always come back to this and go, yeah, but the guy's really got a good heart. Said, that's not a good heart. <laughs> what, what are you thinking? And what he's saying is, well, I love him, his family, you know. And, and really, I mean, you can be nice at times. But then these are evil things. You wouldn't let him near your kids, you know. That's evil. No, he's got a good. No, we don't. And we didn't. That's not why we got saved, because God looks and bring that one in. They're really good people. <laughs> but he saved the lost. And you know what? The, the Bible says, so now we can bring forth some good. Isn't it an amazing thing that we, we can do good things? And you know what's really amazing about this? this bag? Just a thought for you. You know what a treasure is. If you've got boys... You, you understand treasure chests. You know, they, they, they think that's real. You know, the, the pirates, you know, the chest. The chest may be that long, maybe that big. But what's inside? Treasure, right? You open it up, sparkles, diamonds and gold and stuff. And there's, you know, he gives some away. He gives, all of a sudden, you got an empty treasure chest. But you know what God does in our lives? You can give it and give it and give it and go back. It's still there. There's more. There's more out of the good treasure. Jesus said things that have gone right now, things that God has put in there. You can bring forth abundantly. You could just keep doing it. You can live this life for the rest of your days and not run out. These treasures never run out. The more you draw upon the riches of Christ, the better it is. So change your mind about how your outlook, what you see and do in life and what you allow in there. I entreat you also, true yoke fellow. Paul is talking to two good ladies in the church. He's, he's talking to, you know, uh, uh, felt good people. Be of the same mind. Labor together. Do these things. Get along. So start thinking about what you take in. Turn off the anxiety switch. Don't put stuff in that fuels the wrong emotion, the wrong thought process. Matthew 6, 31, simple little quote. Therefore, do not be anxious. Well, about what? Anything. It's, that's the end of the sentence. Just stop. That's Jesus' words. Don't. don't. Don't you hate stuff like that? I mean, it's just cut and dry. Well, what about this? You know, I got a reason. No, he said don't. That's what Jesus said. You can't. It, it's going to harm you. And obviously, he's not telling us to do something that cannot be done. Philippians 2. It's interesting. The whole book of Philippians, all chapters, there, just a few short chapters, but it links its, this thought, you know, about our minds. And, and let this mind be in you, verse 5 says, which also was in Christ Jesus. You and I have the ability to tap into the holy mind of God. 
And it says he, he was in the form of God, but he didn't consider it robbery to be equal with God. He was, ele- he is God, he's everything, but yet he was a man. And what did he do? He made himself of no reputation, took on the form of a bondservant, coming in the likeness of men, being found in appearance as a man. He humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. What the Bible is saying is you take on the mind of Christ. It's a servant's mind. It, you'd be surprised. I have a grandson, a number of them, but just one in particular comes to mind because he, he was being raised in a troubled situation. And, you know, he, he troubled his own world a bit. And then he's about 17, 16, I think. He's at one of our boot camps, and uh, he has a revelation because he is looking for life to get better all the time and for someone to open doors for him and something to happen for him and somebody to do him better. He's looking for these big breaks, but at a boot camp, one of our teen boot camps in North Carolina, he has this revelation, I'm here on earth to serve. He got it. He still has it. He's, he's a married man today, and he's got it. And he's got more victory in his little finger than multiple dudes of people have collectively. He's just happy now to serve. He's not some guy, you know, uh, walking around with a broom after every party, you know, just uh, the janitor. But he cleans everywhere he goes. He's helping. He's serving. And he got it clicked. I've never had to talk to him or explain to him anything about that. He just decided life's going to be better if I quit waiting for life to serve me. That's what he got. And that's what this text is saying. My, you know, brethren, you know, have this mind, the mind of Jesus, who went all the way serving mankind to the point of death. He didn't lose anything by that. Can you say amen? He is risen in glory. He's defeated hell in the grave. He's conquered sin. What a wonder he's, he is. And what was he? He was the servant of all servants. The apostle says, and then go ahead. Join in following my example, Philippians 3, verse 17. Note those who walk this way and have us for a pattern. Many walk, of whom I've told you often and now tell you even weeping. They're the enemies of the cross of Christ. Their end is destruction, whose God is their belly, whose glory is their shame, who set their mind on earthly things. He's saying, here's a problem in the Christian religious world. you got folks who claim to be us, but their mind never changes their mind is on everything in the world you have to declutter the mind you got to get some of the worldly stuff out you know i don't know if you ever thought about that your mind can get cluttered so many of you are way more, i'm i'm i am not tech savvy i am no tech not even slow tech i, I don't get it i won't i'm not going to trouble my world trying to figure it out at this age you know i can text got it down check emails you know but I want to tell you, some of you are tech savvy and you understand your computer gets cluttered. Because I know because guys will come over and say, Pastor, we just need to clean this mess out, you know. And they say, what, can you take all that? Yeah, they take stuff out. Okay, my computer works better. Just stuff gets jammed up. You just start filling it up, you know, and you, you got to get some. Well, you know, your mind can get cluttered. I don't know if you remember, here in North Carolina a few years ago, an old guy, uh, they, were, they were hoarders, cluttered living conditions, him and his wife. He calls and reports his wife missing. It's a true story. And so the cops come, finally, they fill out the report. They sit in the house, and it's, it's horrible. It's just clutter. Their stuff is up to the ceiling. There's a trail through to a couple chairs by a table. And, you know, you fill out the report. A week later, no, no wife. A couple weeks later, they come back to invest, or, you know, talk to them again, and they smell a decomposing body. Bringing the cadaver dogs, and under a pile of stuff that fell, there lay his wife. They cluttered, took her life. Listen, mind clutter. Listen, I, I read a medical piece on this. Not a Christian piece, a medical piece. What was the play? What's the play? Just talked about this morning, the outfit, the big medical outfit, Mayo Clinic. Now, they're not, they're not a, of a religious slant. Simply medical, science. They said this thing people do today with their minds. It's a vicious cycle. Anxiety or depression can lead to a cluttery home. A cluttery home can lead to depression and more anxiety. So it works back and forth. We tend to do less about the house. It makes it even worse. And we overstimulate our minds today and our visual 
olfactory, tactile with these devices. Oh, man, I read a book. Bad Therapy. It's a good read. It's a great read. Amen. <laughs> Not a Christian woman. You'll have to excuse her language sometimes, but she's brilliant. <laughs> and she understands the dark side of therapy. Has no answers. I'm sorry if you think it is. You know, a lot of people say, well, I send my kids to therapy. I'm a good parent. Be careful. Read the book, Bad Therapy, and you'll understand why. But what they're trying to do in there is just to reroute things in the mind. And so what she found by uh, when, when she studied and researched, because she had a child that ended up in therapy, and it just scared her to death when she found out what it was all about. But what they found and what she cites in her book are fantastic, unbelievable um, texts about when queens and teens started experiencing this great anxiety that they have today. Do you know, go back 24 or 5 years, there were no tweens and teens in therapy in America. It's all in it's all in the record. It's, it's medical records. This is not just the preachers telling you this. This is the facts. And you know what the number one cause when these young ladies are mostly young ladies are in therapists <coughs> number one cause of their anxiety is the social network. And it's epidemic. It's huge. Huge. <coughs> and it's all medical facts. It's not me. It's not, not what I want to tell you. It's just the truth. And you know what the second, uh, the number one cause was the social network. And they didn't have any of this happening till kids got cell phones in their hands. And now it's even tweens before teenager levels, boys and girls. And so number two cause was COVID, anxiety. I don't see anyone masked up here today. You're not living in sheer fear and anxiety, but many young people are. Because they're being, this, it, number three, like, oh, man, I got to remember this. Mm. Ah, I don't think I wrote it down. Doggone it. Bad memory. No. Yeah. <laughs> hey, uh, but the, 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 what it is, is it's all man, man. Oh, global warming. They're in those offices with anxiety getting therapy because we're all going to die. <laughs> I'll never grow up. I'll never have kids. Greta Thunberg. <laughs> Self-appointed guru on all these made-up things. Al Gore and a few others. All man fabricated in all three of those things were created by human beings to manipulate work not just manipulate i mean the social network i don't know what good it does actually amen it's nice to communicate but i don't need to read other people's business oh i follow this person you never met him why do you worry about him <laughs> you will never meet them yeah but i hate them they get me you know, what I had a guy come to me once and said, Pastor, have you checked your Facebook page? I said, no, I never had one. He says, yeah, you do. I said, no, I never. I've never looked at Facebook. I've never even seen it. No one's ever showed me anything. I don't know. Your Facebook page. I said, I don't have one. He says, you need to read it. <laughs> I says, I don't have one. I've never, I don't even know how to get Facebook. I've never tried. I'm not interested. He goes, did you, did you ever know a guy named... I said, oh, yes, I know him. He's been institutionalized. He's a nut. Well, he opened me a Facebook page. <laughs> well, there's some firsthand wisdom and insight coming from that man. And he told me his name. I said, oh, my goodness, you're kidding. And, and you know what? People will read that. And, mm, that's the door, huh? Ah, oh, those are Christian people. This guy, had his family institutionalized him. He's, he's, you know, and he doesn't want... Freedom, he's got horrible, horrible issues. It's very sad. But, you know, people get wound up on stuff all the time. I have no business getting wound up. I've got enough real things to deal with in life. I don't need to read other people's thoughts, stuff. And what happens, this overstimulates the mind. It draws our attention away from our focus. 
it makes it more difficult to relax. I'm reading from the book. Physically and mentally. Constantly reminds our brains we still have a huge to-do list. We, it causes more anxiety because other things pile up. It creates feelings of guilt and embarrassment. That certain things just build up and build up and build up. And we never, ever put an end to them. You don't know how to turn them off. Just your mind just keeps going. You may turn that phone off, that screen off, finally at night, you know, and lay there. But your brain's still going, <laughs> trying to connect things. Trying to finish things. Trying to complete thoughts. And you got open ends everywhere up in your brain. We're overly anxious, cluttered with thoughts about things that are absolutely not within our control. See what's happening? Amen. So the thoughts of the righteous, Proverbs 12, 5 says, are right. <laughs> Hallelujah. That's a deep one. Amen. The thoughts of the righteous are right, but the counsels of the wicked are deceit. You know, if you, if you, unclutter, you can unclutter a lot just by deleting and never going certain places. The thoughts of the wicked, Proverbs 15, 26, they're an abomination to the Lord. The heart of the righteous studies to answer, Proverbs 15, 28. It wants to give a proper answer. It wants to know the facts. But if there's no facts or if there's just open-ended stuff going on, we got no business taking it in. It's just going to flop around in your brain. The thoughts of the diligent tend only to plenteous, but everyone that's hasty to what? Proverbs 21, 5. You know, uh, these, these are things God, God says, I, I, I have to judge this stuff. Pro uh, Jeremiah, the prophet, prophet, in chapter 6, in verse 19, he said, Hear, O earth, behold, I will bring evil upon this people, even the fruit of their thoughts, because they have not hearkened to my word or rejected my law, but reject it. You know, what God's saying is, you know what? Their thoughts control them. They won't even, they won't even give me space in their heads for this. God's thoughts are not our thoughts. They just aren't. Isaiah 55 tells us in verse 8. He wants to help us. He wants to help his people. So what we can do, and I'm going to wind down with this thought, is we can... Do exactly what the Bible says, cast all our care upon him. You know, Duke University, just down the road, every so often they get grants for things, and they funded a study on peace of mind. And, you know, I'm telling you the truth. I, I wrote all these things down, but it takes a while to read it. But ten top things they wrote down literally can be condensed into a short sentence. Read your Bible. <laughs> Unbelievable, man. And sometimes these studies blow up on these, you know, these, the worldly institutions. They study said, oh, she whiz, we should have read the Bible. They said the absence of suspicion and resentment. You want peace of mind? Stop the absence of suspicion. Some people suspect everyone. Some people resent someone and it grows into other. Nursing grudges. Oh, they're a major factor in happiness. No kidding. That was the number one thing they discovered. Number two, stop living in the past. An unwholesome preoccupation with old mistakes and failures leads to depression. Sit around and think about it. What do we call them? Crying over spilt milk. Clean it up. Go on with life. Stop wasting time and energy fighting conditions you can't change. Cooperate. <laughs> Force yourself to stay involved with the living world. Resist the temptation to withdraw, become reclusive during times of emotional stress. Refuse to indulge in self-pity. Cultivate old-fashioned virtues. Duke discovered this, like love, humor, <laughs> compassion. In other words, just be a decent person, man. Love people. They said, man, there's so much of this in life. You know, people are filled with anxiety. They are unhappy. They're miserable. They have no peace of mind. What's the cause of this? If they would know God and obey God. Like I said, I hand out the prescription. Philippians chapter 4. I, I read that. Well, well, I read it every day. It'll make you think. Make you go back to it. Make you want to pull down those strongholds. Raise you up in victory. And as many of us, Philippians 3 says in verse 15, that are perfect. 
We're not perfect, but he's talking about on the road to perfection. Be thus minded, or in other words, take on this mind. And if anything else you are otherwise minded, God will reveal it unto you. Nevertheless, let uh, where you we have already attained, let us walk by the same rule. Let us mind the same thing. We can get our minds right, folks. You have the wherewithal to do that. You can control it. You have to decide what's not coming in anymore. Okay, you got quiet. I'm going to try that again. You have to decide what you're going to allow in. Well, TikTok is pretty entertaining. No, no, no. It just gets a black hole. There's no bottom. You go down there, and I had someone tell me just recently, because I've never messed with it, but they came up to me and told me, they said, it just links you to one thing after another after another. And I know it's all things that are virtuous. Well, no, wait, no, no, it's things that are worthy of, pr no, it's not. The things that are lovely, holy. No. Yeah. Well, it helps my peace? No. Hey, I, I'm not, I'm not anti, you can't ever, you know, connect with someone. I'm, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about get control. And it might mean you have to cut some stuff off. And it definitely means you have to learn what to put in. Whatever things are pure, holy, lovely, worthy of a good report. That's the stuff you've got to learn to think on. And you know why? Because then the God of peace, the God of peace will grant you total peace, victory. It's so nice to lay your head down and just go to sleep at night. I told pastor, he said, how you sleep? I said, this, this room I'm in has a spirit of slumber. It's wonderful. Amen. I'm going to sleep like a rock in that bed. I'm going to steal one of their pillows. Amen. <laughs> and I'll have a guilty conscience and won't be able to sleep. Amen. But just, you know, I'm just joking. But, you know, it's just, it's just really nice to not have your heart overwhelmed. Waste time and energy just scrambling your thoughts and Concerned about things you, number one, can never change. You know, work conditions. Well, you know what? Do your best at what you do. and Do it like you're doing it for God. And be a testimony and a witness. If Victor Frankel, who's not a God-fearing man, can endure a death camp and come out with the victory and help other people, why can't we who are in Christ rise up? Come above this and walk in the victory. Amen. Let's bow our heads tonight. We want to pray.